In this video, I'm gonna build a subwoofer enclosure for an American-based Titan 12-inch subwoofer using these really cool precision ports that I got from Parts Express. Conventional wisdom says that a flared port is superior to just a regular open port because with a flare on the end, you're gonna reduce port noise, also known as chuffing. The rule of thumb most people use is that your port airspeed velocity should be below about 17 or 18 meters per second. You can model this in WinISD, and that's a very important threshold to hit if you want a sound quality enclosure. If you're shooting for SPL, you can get away with a much higher airspeed velocity, but eventually you will hit a point where you'll actually limit your SPL due to that airspeed velocity. Now, the other way you can get your airspeed velocity lower is to use a port with a bigger cross section so the opening of the port's gonna be bigger. Or you can even use multiple ports. But when you do that, you run into another problem. If you wanna maintain the same tuning frequency, the port has to get longer. If you're not careful, you end up with an absurdly large port. More on that later. And that's the advantage of going with a flare. The rule of thumb when using a flared port is you can double the airspeed velocity. So instead of 17 or 18 meters per second, you're looking at 34 or 36 meters per second. And you end up with a smaller port cross section and therefore a shorter port, which is easier to fit inside the enclosure. When using a flared port, half of the flare belongs to the port itself and the other half belongs to the outside air. So you can't use the full size of the flare in your port calculations. So you've got to carefully measure your flare if you're going to use a flared port. That's one reason why I like these precision ports. After you figure out your desired enclosure size and tuning frequency, you can just go to the precision port website and they tell you the overall length of your port. The standard kit has a one foot centerpiece plus two flares for an overall length of 18 inches. Unfortunately, they don't sell elbows. So if you need a bend inside of your enclosure, you'll have to adapt the precision port to a PVC or ABS plastic, which is a little bit of a problem because the wall on these ports is just a tad thinner than the wall for PVC pipe. So you've got to construct some kind of coupling to make it work. When you're designing and building the enclosure, you've got to pay very close attention to the overall outside diameter of these ports. These flares are actually pretty big. For a four inch aero port, the overall outside diameter of the flare is seven and a quarter inches, and you'll need a six and a quarter inch cutout. After modeling the enclosure in WinISD and then verifying the port length using the Precision Port website, I found out that a full 18 inch piece is gonna get me really close to what I'm looking for for my tuning frequency. So I'm just gonna use a full 18 inch piece. I don't need to extend it or shorten it or anything. But if you need to shorten yours, it's just a matter of cutting this 12 inch piece down to the right size. And if your port needs to be longer, you can buy additional pieces and additional couplings to get any length that you want. Box construction is straightforward. I'm gonna be using some birch veneer plywood to save on weight. This stuff's a lot lighter than MDF. And what I like to do is have them cut it down to just slightly oversized. So maybe a half inch bigger than the size that I actually need in case they make a mistake and I can cut it down to the final width on my table saw. Now in this case, that was a smart thing to do because for some reason, one of the pieces was slightly out of square. I've never had that happen before. They always do a really good job up until now. So I ran that piece through the saw and everything came out nice and square, no problem at all. From there, it's just a matter of cutting down the rest of the pieces. The goal here is to move the table saw fence as little as possible. So after I make that first initial cut, I've only got to move the fence two more times. The really tricky part about this build is the speaker cutouts. The specifications are all in metric, so you've got to convert them over to the freedom units. We use freedom units here on this channel. So the cutout is 288 millimeters, which is just about 11 and 5 16 of an inch. I rounded that up just a little bit to make sure it would fit, but that was a little bit sloppy. So I went with 11 and 5 16 of an inch for the cutout. The overall outside diameter when converted to freedom units was 12 and a quarter inches, but that was actually a little bit snug when I did my test cut. Since I'm going to do a recessed baffle, I need to know that number. Now the subwoofer itself turns out to be quite the little beast. This thing is an 800 watt RMS subwoofer. It's got 17.5 millimeters of X-Max. It's got a Kevlar reinforced cone, a triple layer foam surround, and a double layer Konex Spider. It also has some nice perimeter venting down here. It's got a double stacked 170 ounce magnet. I'm really loving the look of that white basket. I think it would look good inverted or even like with a window or something. Now the design calls for a brace and the port is gonna to have to pass through the brace. And that's nice because then the brace can also support the port as well. And that means you've gotta make sure that the holes on the outside of the box line up with the holes in the brace. 
and there's a trick to making that work. Take one of the pieces and mark out the center holes for my ports, and then I take the two pieces and line them up together. Then I grab some clamps to hold the edges together to make sure the two pieces are perfectly square to one another. So that point's gonna be where I put the pin for my circle jig for cutting out the circles, and now they're gonna be lined up together perfectly. And while I've got the router jig out, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the hole for the terminal cup in the other end piece. When I cut these circles, my typical method is to clamp a spoil board down to my workbench and then tape the piece to that spoil board. And this is the tape that I'm using. And this tape, it's absolutely terrible. It just completely sucks. It's really hard to get the paper backing off the back and it doesn't stick very well. Now that that hole's cut, I'm going back to the brace. I'm going to cut out those windows. It's a pretty straightforward process. I just drilled out all four corners of the window and then grabbed my jigsaw and cut those out, kind of staying along the lines. And y'all, here's an important tip for you. If your jigsaw isn't going through the wood just like butter, that just means your blade is dull. So don't be afraid to throw the old blade away and snap a new one in. Now this next step is completely optional. If you don't have the tools, you don't have to do it but I like to take it over to the router and give it a little cleanup as well and then hit it with a roundover bit. Since the plan is to carpet the box, I'm gonna grab the rabbiting bit, put a little groove around these edge pieces. That's gonna make it easier to put the carpet on later. So if you've ever watched any of my channel before, you know that this is my absolute favorite part right here. I finished all the router work. I finished all the wood cutting. I'm done making sawdust. And now I get to actually put the box together. This is the part where you really feel like you're doing something because it's all coming together. There are a lot of different ways to put together an enclosure. My way is not necessarily the best way or the right way for you. But what I like to do is I like to use wood glue and brad nails. I'm gonna take clamps and use the clamps as extra hands to hold things together just long enough for me to get a brad nail driven. And after the brad nail is driven, I can then unclamp, move to the next piece and just kind of move iteratively through the process. I typically start with like a bottom or a back to form a base and then get a side up. And after you get a couple of sides up, you don't really need as many clamps. Now here I'm installing the brace and the exact position of the brace isn't really that important. You just have to make sure it doesn't interfere with the speaker cut out in the baffle and you have to make sure it doesn't interfere with the internal flares on these ports. But it is important that you get the brace square. So I've got more than one of these carpenter squares or speed squares or whatever you happen to call them. And so I'm gonna use a couple of them at the same time to make sure it's nice and square. That's gonna be real handy later when I go to drive in the brad nails from the outside of the box you won't be able to see where the brace is at. And so without marking it and making sure it's square, you're just gonna miss the brace when you start driving your brad nails. And that's just gonna be a train wreck and you don't wanna do that. Since I know that it's nice and square, I can go ahead and scribe a line on the outside of the enclosure. That way I know exactly where I need to drive my brad nails. Now it's time to attach the baffles and I've gotten into the habit of attaching these two separately. So I'm gonna put the first baffle down Make sure there's plenty of glue, of course, and then brad nail that to the brace and the sides of the enclosure. And then I'm gonna put the second baffle down. I recently picked up this right here. This is a glue bottle that has a roller on the end of it. And so far it's the easiest way that I've found to spread a large amount of glue over a large surface. I'll make sure I'll give you a link to one down in the description if you think you wanna pick one up for yourself. Now that the assembly is done, it's back to the router. So what I'm doing here is I'm trimming around the edges and it's not unusual to have a little bit of extra wood around the edges that you need to trim off, especially when you're using plywood because most plywood is slightly undersized. It's a 32nd of an inch too small. So if you have two layers of plywood together like you have on the right and left side of the enclosure, then your entire enclosure is gonna be undersized by a 16th of an inch. To ensure that I've got a good seal between the port and the box, I'm gonna apply some gasket tape. I get this at Parts Express. And then I'm gonna pre-drill my holes and screw these ports down to the enclosure. Now those big internal flares are not gonna fit 
through those external holes. So you've got to reach inside of the enclosure to attach the internal flare. So earlier when I was mocking the box up, I grabbed some shots of what that would look like with the side off of the enclosure so you can kind of see inside it and see what's involved. You just got to reach your hand into the woofer hole and reach through the window so you can stick the port on. Now what I recommend is holding everything together temporarily with tape until you verify the tuning frequency and give it a good listen to make sure you're happy with your result. Then you can come back later and put it all together permanently using ABS cement. I went ahead and screwed the subwoofer down off camera. There's a billion YouTube videos showing how to screw down a subwoofer. Do you really need to see that one more time? If you've watched any of my videos before, you probably know what's about to happen next. Got this little magic box right here. This is called a DATS. That stands for Dayton Audio Test System. And this will tell us the tuning frequency of the enclosure. So let's run it real quick and see what we get. So according to the dash, the tuning frequency is 32 hertz. Once you put that in a car and get some cabin gain, you're gonna get some really nice lows out of this thing. So now it's time to give it a test bump. I'm gonna be using some uh, copyrighted music so I can't let you listen to it. To be perfectly honest, I was really expecting it to be a little bit louder, especially as big and beefy and as much power as this subwoofer could take. But it did sound nice and clean. There was absolutely no port noise coming from those big massive flared ports. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. I think the box looks amazing. I'm not actually gonna carpet yet because I built this for one of my patrons and he said he was gonna carpet it himself. So I'm gonna ship this off to him, let him take care of it. If you'd like a copy of these plans, I'm gonna put them for sale on my Teespring store. You can see the merch shelf down below with all my merch. If you'd like to learn more about tuning ported enclosures, check out this video right over here. Before I go, I gotta say thank you to my patrons over on Patreon, especially $25 patron Dylan, who helped out by chipping in the wood for this box. So Dylan, this box is going on a FedEx truck and it's shipping out to you. Hope you enjoy your box, Dylan.